Now we're going to go on to the objections. Let's begin. We have to begin with space aliens. Where else do you begin? Interestingly enough, serious scientists have raised this. Nobel laureates Francis Crick and Leslie Orgel. Now, again, he was the one who was one of the, the if not the premier origin of life specialist. Both of them published a paper together back in the 80s saying that life was created through a process called um, directed panspermia. Directed pan, panspermia. Now, I put playfully with a question mark after it because I don't know how serious they were when they put this forth. I will say, though, Crick said this twice. He said it first in 1973 with Orgel and again in 1980s with uh, this book, um, Life Itself. So they said that either undirected panspermia, well, pan meaning everything and spermia meaning life, um, undirected panspermia would mean that meteorites came from other parts of the universe, traveled to Earth, gave us the building blocks of life, and maybe even DNA and organelles, and they survived on these asteroids. That'd be undirected. That's just meteorites going to the different parts of the universe. They landed on Earth. They're here. Maybe it was during the Hadean era. I don't know. And we got the building blocks of life that way. Incidentally, we have meteorites that do have uh, certain amino acids on them. And some people have said, well, that's where we got uh, the origin of life. Okay, directed panspermia would be Ridley Scott. This is from, uh, what's that series? It's the Alien series, but the most recent is Prometheus, thank you. I really enjoyed that film. I know it's not a very, uh, or is it a Christian film? <laughs> I don't know, it's very confusing. I think he's confused, uh, Ridley Scott, but um, hope he doesn't take offense to that. He probably doesn't care what I think. Anyways, so um, this would be the idea that aliens traveled to Earth, seeded the planet, intentionally because they're extraterrestrial intelligent life. That was the view of Francis Crick and Leslie Orgel. Again, I don't know how serious they were, but that was their view. Richard Dawkins, the uh, atheist, also speculated about this view. Here's one of the uh, scenes from the movie Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed, where he expounds on this. Check it out. Well, then how did it get created? Well, um, by a very slow process. Well, how did it start? Nobody knows how, how it started. We know the kind of event that it must have been. We know the sort of event that, that must have happened for the origin of life. And what was that? It was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. Right, how did that happen? I told you, we don't know. So you have no idea how it started? No, 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 no nor has anybody. Nor has anyone else. What do you think is the possibility that, there, that intelligent design might turn out to be uh, the answer to some issues in uh, genetics or in, well, in evolution? It could come about in the following way. It could be that uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization e evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this, this planet. Um, now, that is a possibility and an intriguing possibility. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry and molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer Wait a second, Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Um, and that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. So Professor Dawkins was not against intelligent design, just certain types of designers, such as God. Kind of an interesting point he's making there, Ben Stein. Why is it that he's saying you could discover signs of intelligence in the cell a signature in the cell, is what he said, that could show that it was an intelligent cause, but it would have to be an alien of some kind. Yeah. Well, this admits the need for a designer. This only shows that this argument actually is cogent. See, an argument needs to be valid, which means that internally it's consistent. It needs to be sound, meaning that each premise is at least 51% probable. And then from there, you could say that's a good argument. But is it cogent? Is it persuasive? This would, this would show the fact that somebody of Leslie Orgel's or Francis Crick who helped uh, discover DNA, when you have scientists like this honestly saying spacemen came to Earth and seeded the planet with the first life, when you have people of their stripe saying that, 
you've got to wonder if we have a problem with the origin of life studies, that there is some big lacuna in our thinking that is just not being explained. And we're, we're the scientists looking at the magnets on the fridge saying, what natural cause could explain this? Was it the wind? Was it the dog? Was it the force of slant? It's not any of those forces. It's design. And even he is admitting that. To say that it can only be a natural designer is metaphysically prejudicial, metaphysically prejudiced. This is where Alvin Plantinga comes in, in his great book, Where the Conflict Really Lies. Alvin Plantinga, in the estimation of William Lane Craig, Alvin Plantinga is the greatest living Christian philosopher. Now, when William Lane Craig says that you're the greatest living Christian philosopher, that makes you the greatest living Christian philosopher, right? Alvin Plantinga wrote this book entitled, Where the Conflict Really Lies. Is it God and science? Well, he was interviewed on NPR. And they, I could tell the interviewer had not read the book, okay? Because she kept saying, is it God and science? Is that where the conflict really lies? And Plantinga, as brilliant as he is, is not the best speaker. He's got a great voice. He's got this rich baritone voice that could either just rivet you or put you to sleep. But he's not, he's not the best speaker. So he went on to describe in the interview, the conflict is not between God and science. The conflict is between God and naturalism. The thought that there's only nature and nothing beyond it. Of course that's the conflict. If you believe in naturalism, <clears throat> excuse me, if you believe in naturalism, you can't believe in God. And if you believe in God, you can't believe in naturalism. However, if you believe in God and you believe in science, Plantinga argues in this book, there is no difficulty with the two. The question just is, is it a natural cause or is there a supernatural cause? Was there natural processes or was there a mind? And Plantinga just argues, why wouldn't we be open to reasonable explanations that have the most explanatory power and the most explanatory scope? That's his point. He's not arguing for any scientific argument. He's just showing the problem is not God and science. The problem is God and naturalism. Now, if you really want to dig deep into this question of did space aliens bring life to Earth, you should do yourself a favor. Pick up Dr. Hugh Ross's book, Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men. It's co-authored with Kenneth Samples and Mark Clark. But Ross is really the engine behind this book. Hugh Ross is an astronomer. But before he went into vocational ministry, I was going to say full-time ministry. We're all full-time ministers. Vocational ministry means he gets paid for it. That's the difference. When he went into vocational ministry in this uh, ministry of apologetics, before that, he worked at Caltech. And this guy really is brilliant when it comes to the science. I do have some disagreements over um, interpretation of Genesis and so forth. But for the most part, this guy is... He is uh, the bee's knees, as we like to say. The cat's pajamas, if you will. All right, he says this in his book. He says, only a tenth of a percent of stars in the universe have planets. So right there, we are shortening down. Now, wait a minute. We have 200 billion galaxies, and each one has about 200 billion stars. So that's, <laughs> wow, that's a lot. But, and only a tenth of a percent, that's still a lot of planets out there. However, in that small smaller pool of planets, Ross says the odds of a habitable planet for life is 10 to the 174th power. Now, if you want to dig into this deeper, go ahead. You can pick up uh, Guillermo Gonzalez's book, um, Privileged Planet, or Hugh Ross's book, The Improbable Planet. And he'll go through how he gets that number, um, why it's so difficult to find an exoplanet or a habitable planet, and I know in the media, the media are always sharing in popular science, oh, we found a planet like Earth. They mean it's like in some respect close to Earth. But meeting all these various criteria, maybe it meets one criterion, but not all the criteria that you would need for a habitable planet. Ross also points out the difficulties with interstellar travel. This is in chapter five, I think, somewhere around there. He says the scale of space... Um, I think the illustration he uses is the size of the sun, if that was the size of an orange, um, to move from our 
solar system to the nearest solar system would be like moving from uh, Los Angeles to New York, just to give you the scale of just how far this really is. And, and our sun can fit, I don't know how many uh, millions of Earths inside of it. And just to show the scale that we're speaking of here, uh, to add insult to injury, the speed of travel is very, very, very difficult to energize a spaceship to travel in interstellar space, across space, from one planet to another. The energy required is absolutely unfathomable, and he talks all about that, and dangerous. We can't go at the speed of light because uh, that would give you uh, infinite density and mass to be able to move that. So it's got to be somewhere slower, which means a lot more energy to speed up that spacecraft. But as you approach the speed of life, uh, speed of light, anything that gets in the way is going to be horrifically dangerous to your spacecraft. So if you come across any kind of debris, if you come across uh, radiation, uh, anything tiny, 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 moving uh, anywhere near the speed of light, it's going to completely rip to shreds your spacecraft. He said the fastest you could go is about 1% to be safe. And to take that long, that would mean that uh, uh, a trip that started today wouldn't end for hundreds of thousands of years, which would mean that this is an intergenerational space trip. So I get on the trip with my wife and we do a, you know, uh, Noah's Ark kind of a thing. We get, you know, maybe a hundred couples, but then again, we got to keep the ship small, but whatever, we're in science fiction world here. So we get a hundred couples and then we breed and then they take over this and we teach them all the mechanics and hopefully they're all smart and astronauts and brilliant, you know, like they're like perfect looking and in perfect shape and also like geniuses, which is astronauts, right? So all of our kids are perfect, but then their kids are that way. Uh, but then we're all interbreeding, right? With each other. So that's a problem. Um, I mean, he gets into like freezing eggs from other people. Uh, so, so now we're doing in vitro fertilization on a spaceship, moving at one one hundredth of the speed of light. Um, then he gets into the point, what if, you know, you're 10 generations in and the kids are like, this was mom and great, great, great granddad's idea. I don't want to do this mission. I'm going back home. And to keep all the amount of food and everything on there, just to get here to see lovely old us. Uh, he says, by far, it would be more likely that they would send robots. Robots. Anyways, you got to read the book. It's, uh, it's pretty interesting. Now, everything I just said, for people that have been raised like myself on science fiction, you're like, nah, uh there's wormholes, there's warp drive, <laughs> there's all these things. And you're like, we just don't know. You don't know. You have not seen the newest science fiction film where they do this. Okay, I know like we're so ingrained to think that you can do this, but we're talking to a physicist and astro astronomer from Caltech. And he's just like, no, you, you don't know what you're talking about. And that's his point here. All right. What about the famous Miller-Urey experiment in 1953? Stanley Miller and Harold Urey, I can't remember who was the mentor of whom, but um, they produced amino acids in a lab, laboratory. They used a mixture of ammonia and methane and hydrogen, and they put this into this sealed container, a beaker, if you will, but uh, something more complex than that. And then they passed electricity through it. And on the outside rim of the glass, they discovered that they had created amino acids. So this was hailed as a huge leap forward in origin of life studies. And if you've studied this in high school, uh, undergraduate, graduate work, they still go back to the famed Miller-Urey experiment. That they produced amino acids. And what this showed was if you had ammonia, simple things like ammonia, methane, and hydrogen, and maybe there's a lightning strike in that primordial soup, uh, then you could get the building blocks of life. There you go. Okay, fair enough. There's the problem. Since that experiment, we are no closer to explaining anything else that I just said for the rest of the evening. The organelles, the specified complexity, the homochirality of amino acids and sugars. Um, the way Paul Davies puts it is this. He says, they are as far from the completed product as a brick is to the empire state building. Think about this. If you misplace one amino acid in 
the protein. This results in sickle cell anemia. One protein, one amino acid. That's what we're talking about with a level of specificity here. Imagine later tonight, you talk to one of your buddies and he says, man, I just met the coolest girl. By the way, your buddy's single and he's young and he's, he's uh, uh, single and looking to mingle, okay? And he says, I just met the coolest girl. Man, she is smart. She is funny. She's got this winning smile. She is so into God. I mean, I just, she, she talks about God. It's like a personal thing in her life. It's amazing. And she's really hot too, okay? She's also really hot, all right? And uh, I talked to her and at the end of our conversation, she gave me her phone number. And you say, wow, congratulations. That is so great, man. I've just been hoping you've been getting a girlfriend. This is so great. All right, so where, where's the phone number? And he goes, I got it right. I got it right. Uh, it's, uh, it's right. Uh, no, no, it's, it's in the, uh, uh, it's gone. It's gone. I don't have it. I, don't, I, I, I threw it away. I threw it away. The cafeteria. I don't have, I don't have the phone number. I don't have the phone number. And he, you know, he starts to freak out. He's like, I'm never going to see her again. I don't know who she is. I don't have her number. She's going to think I don't like her. And, uh, you know, so your buddy's freaking out. And you go, hold on a second. Wait, wait, buddy, dude. I got you. He says, you do? Yeah, I got you. Look it. Check this out. I got a phone. Her number is, uses, uh, what is it, 614. We got that, right? Okay. And then we just need the other seven digits. I got all the digits on my phone. I got zero through nine, and we're good. So just, if we just, you know, I got the building blocks, we just need the number. You see the problem? What we're talking about here, um, you, could, you could type through every single one of the numbers that's possible on that phone, wouldn't bring you even near to the probabilities we're talking about for life. Not even near. You could be sitting there getting every person in the greater Columbus area and uh, never, never uh, getting this girl on the phone. Okay, what we're talking about for life, so much different. And when you make a number that's wrong, you're dead. All right. Miller and Yuri, by the way, were wrong about the early Earth's atmosphere. They thought it was methane, ammonia, etc. They thought it was like Jupiter's atmosphere. They were wrong about this. That was not the atmosphere of the early Earth. Instead, the early Earth had carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and water vapor. When we put this into the closed system, fire the electricity through it, what do we get? Nothing. We don't even have the building blocks for life. What about the RNA world? This is very popular. People say, well, we couldn't get DNA. Yeah, it's really hard. DNA and proteins, uh, that whole chicken and egg problem. So uh, what about RNA? RNA could give you the, not just the, the information in the RNA nucleotide, the uh, nucleic acid, but RNA also has catalytic properties. It has enzymes. So we don't have that chicken and egg problem anymore. We've got the information with the RNA on the nucleic acid. We've also got an enzyme that in the early earth, this could have been used to create the first cell. This is called the RNA world. This is the hypothesis. Again, I'm just going to keep repeating this. This doesn't explain for the specified complexity to create life. Oh, again, it's like your teacher at the beginning of, of the lecture earlier, where I was like, yeah, all you need is proteins. All you need is DNA. And then you get the thing, and it's, that's life. All you need is, is DNA. All you need are proteins. You still haven't explained why those amino acids need to be lined up in a certain way to create life. What about this specific protein, this enzyme? This isn't a uh, ribosome, this is a ribozyme. These uh, very primitive and very, um, uh, primitive isn't the right word, uh, limited, limited enzymes um, can't do the functions of proteins. All that, that whole elaborate thing I was describing of the membrane and it's porous and there's locks and you get in cytoplasm, microtubules, um, uh, ribosomes, all, all these things that we're describing here, a nucleus, a nucleolus, all of that being described. Oh yeah, the ribozyme, that's going to fill it. The way Stephen Meyer puts this is he says, that's like saying, go build a house. Here's a hammer and here's some nails. 
uh, first of all, I don't have any plans, and I've never built anything in my life. Uh, I think you need wood, right? Don't you need wood to build a house? Uh, concrete, I've never mixed that before. Um, rebar, don't you need rebar? What about electric, electrical outlets? How do you plug those in? He's like, no, here's the hammer and nails. That's like getting the ribozymes. That, that's your enzyme in the RNA world. Good luck. And uh, in order to make this work in the lab, that's what I love. They always do the RNA world in the lab, and then they say, we figured it out. With the aid of very, very intelligent scientists making this happen based off previous blueprints and actually stealing from previous living cells. Oh, dear God. Yeah, that, that car, that, that Maserati just came together. How? Well, first we took a primitive Maserati, you know, from the junkyard, and then we got a new engine from over here, and we put that together, and then we got the, you know, the transmission, and then we put it together. And who put this together? An engineer and from a previous Maserati, yeah. And then we put it all together, and now, yeah, that explains how Maseratis were created. Uh, if you can believe that, uh, I have nothing to share with you. Go ahead. What about creating life in the lab? On this, we'll close. You're going to hear me talk tonight, and then you're going to get on Google, and you're going to be typing in, what about the origin of life? And you're going to get, you know, life science and all the, the media are always talking about how they've discovered the origin of life. They've discovered. It's all been figured out. You're going to watch on YouTube. Um, that's what people call research these days, is we get on YouTube. So I researched it. And, um, and I think YouTube's great to supplement your research, by the way, but not to be a foundation for your research. Uh, we got to pick up books and journal articles that we need to actually read. That's research. And compare the opposing views and stuff. Okay, anyways, sermonette done. So um, you're going to go out there and you're going to look up, you know, have we figured out the origin of life? And the resounding answer is going to be yes, we found it. We are no closer we are no closer to the origin of life than in 1952 when the Yuri Miller experiment was just in diapers. In fact, we're farther away. People like Craig Ventner, who's a synthetic chemist, he took a bacterium, you know, bacteria plural, bacterium singular, yeast, and took it down to its most minimal complexity. And then inside of this, he put his email address into the different uh, uh, information put in names, uh, literary passages, and the genome of this uh, bacterium. And uh, from that, they said, here we go. Uh, Craig Ventner, you know, busted open the origin of life. What he did was strip down a pre-existing yeast, a bacterium. So too, a lot of times what they'll say is we've created life. Well, what is it? Is it a prokaryote or a eukaryote? Uh, it's a virus. <laughs> Viruses are parasitic on life. They are not life. So um, same thing here with bacteria. Bacteria go away. Uh, we're talking about life. And so big problems here. What we see when people say, I've heard TNA hypothesis. A guy had the audacity to tell me, yeah, TNA, basically that kind of life, that's figured out the origin of life. I went back and looked. I never heard of it. Went back and looked it up. 100 molecule strand in a lab. Can't survive in nature. And if it's so easy, why isn't this, uh, this TNA cell abundant all over the earth? Why don't we see this anywhere? And it can't survive now anyways. Uh, yeah, life in the lab. I, I, I mean, I hope they keep studying this. I don't want this to be a science stopper at all. I'm saying this. I'm saying when they create life in the lab with plenty of brilliant people, intelligent people, and they do it with plenty of funding, tons of money, I mean, they've got great... Uh, purified chemicals, exquisite laboratories, state-of-the-art technology, great education, clean containers, not just a bunch of slop like in the early earth. And then they borrow parts from all over the place and put it together, and they say, that's life. I say, give me a break. That's not life. We're no closer. Paul Davies says this, life began in nature without the benefit of high-tech laboratories and uh, delicate step-by-step -step procedures implemented under carefully controlled conditions. That's a good point. This whole um, movement of getting the right sequence to get the right organelles in the right cell, if you flub up on one of those, that takes you right back to zero. And then you're waiting on the evolutionary process to bring this all back together by chance, it could flub up again. 
And again, we've got 50 million years here. What if it takes you a million years to get to the first part? And we've got, we've got hundreds of sequences. Uh, anyways, he says, above all, it, is, uh, it got going without the use of an intelligent designer. Yes, yes, uh, does not count. If you can show, as a scientist, how this would have happened naturally, that counts. Creating this yourself does not count. And the reports of life have been highly exaggerated. That's, of course, a play on the quote attributed to Mark Twain. The reports of my death have been highly exaggerated. Reports of life have been highly exaggerated. Here's James Tor. If you've never had a chance to read or, more importantly, listen, watch James Tor, you haven't lived. This guy is larger than life. He's a synthetic, organic chemist. He has 700 publications in peer-reviewed journals. He has started 14 companies for profit, and he has been cited 100,000 times in peer-reviewed academic literature. They're all citing James Tor on synthetic chemistry. This class is 13 lectures long. He all does it in the same clothes because he did it all at once. He just sat down one day and just recorded 13 lectures. But the more you get to know James Tor, that kind of sounds like something you would do because he's just like a larger-than-life personality. Okay, I really got to do an aside here. Watch his debate with Josh Swamidas. The first 30 minutes is James Tor yelling at Josh Swamidas, yelling. And the interviewer is like, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. And James Tor says, no, no, no. I'm not angry with Josh. I love Josh. This is just the way I talk. Josh is eating at this table. I love this. This is a great man. I love, but throughout the whole debate, he's just screaming. It's Swamidas. Anyways, this guy is a character. This is what he says. He says, chemical synthesis experiments and origin of life can be summed up by this protocol and analogous, by a protocol analogous to this. First, you purchase some chemicals general, generally in high purity from a chemical company. <laughs> uh, he says this with a smile on his face. You call up, we have the right, yeah, we have the methane perfectly, and we have this perfectly. Okay, yeah, P perfectly pure chemicals and lots of them. Next, obtain a mixture of compounds that have a resemblance to one or more of the basic four classes of chemicals needed for life. Like what? Carbohydrates, nucleotides, amino acids, or lipids. Not in homochiral form. <laughs> yeah, skip over that part. Identify the desired compound that you want in the mixture of many other isomers and products, then buy or make using non, <laughs> modern non-abiotic methods, right? No, that's a double negative, non-abiotic methods using biotic methods, life existing already, then buy a purified version of that desired compound. Publish a paper making bold extrapolations about origin of life from these functionless, crude mixtures of stereochemically scrambled intermediates. Uh, stereochemically, meaning that they're working together. They're not working together. They're, they're scrambled. He says, engage with the often overzealous press to dial up the knob of unjustified origin of life projections. Watch the misled and mesmerized layperson exclaim, you see, scientists understand how life was formed. And he gives example after example in the class, in this chapter in the book, Mystery of Life's Origin. That was from the 80s. Groundbreaking book. Very powerful book. Um, they gave him a chapter in the update in 2020. He gives example after example where they've done just this. Check this out. See what, see what you think of this. We do not know how to build even a simple bacterium. The simplest bacterium with its 256 protein coding genes, we have no idea how to build it. First of all, we don't know how to build the molecules, the four classes of molecules that are needed for it. We don't know how to, even if we had those four classes of molecules, assemble them even into a, the simplest of bacteriums. We don't know how to do that. One can do that with the technologies we have today. We can make technologies, but we can't even make the simplest bacterium. Anybody who would say con something contrary does not know what they are talking about. Show me the demonstration. Nobody has ever done it. And it's not because of lack of, of, of effort. It's not because of lack of will. First of all, they haven't been able to get the molecules to do this. And if they could make the molecules, even if we were to give them the molecules, they wouldn't have the information. There would be no inherent information in the DNA. But even if we gave them the DNA in the structure that they wanted, they wouldn't know how to put all the components together because of the sophistication within a cell. The interactomes, meaning that the interacting connectivity between the molecules, the van der Waals interactions, all of these have to be in the right place and in the right order for a cell to function. We don't even know how to define life, let alone knowing how to spark it to begin. 
you got to watch that full interview. It's so, I mean, he's being interviewed by the Discovery Institute, and he's just, you know, it's just them and the interviewer, and he's screaming at the interviewer. <laughs> it's so awesome because he's so frustrated. People are like, oh, yeah, uh, the guy, uh, Jack, uh, so-and-so over at, uh, I can't remember how to pronounce his last name, over at Harvard. I watched his whole lecture. Yeah, we got it all figured out. He's like, I love Jack. He's a great guy. He's a brilliant you know, chemist. He's dead wrong. <laughs> and he gives the 18 reasons why he's wrong. Um, watch just a couple of those episodes. You'll see. This guy sees it. He says, yeah, biologists love to talk about this. He says, that's the problem with biologists. They've never created anything. This guy is a chemist, and he's at the top of his field. It's, it's pretty awesome. Well, I came through on my promise. Many people were asking, what book should we read? I put the more difficult books at the top, if you really want to dig deep, if you're just getting started. Those books at the bottom, 